well, I have this fear of being buried alive in a box. <laughs> I just, I start thinking about being buried alive and I begin to panic. Has, has, has anyone ever, ever tried to, to bury you alive in a box? No, no, but truly thinking about it does make my life horrible. I mean, I can't go through tunnels or be in an elevator or in a house, anything boxy. So what, what you're saying is you're, uh, you're claustrophobic. Uh, yes, yes, that's it. All right, well, uh, let's go, Catherine. I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, say two words to you right now. I, I want you to listen to them very, very carefully. Then I want you to take them out of the office with you and incorporate them in, into your life. Well, shall I uh, write them down? Well, it, if it makes you comfortable, it's just two words. Most, we find most people can, uh, can remember them. <laughs> okay. You ready? Yes. Okay, here, here they are. Stop it! <laughs> Stop it? Yes. S-T-O-P, new word, I-T. So, what are you saying? <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. I, I, I say two simple words, and I cannot tell you the amount of people who say exactly the same thing you're saying. I mean, this, you know, this is not Yiddish, Catherine. This is English. <laughs> Stop it. So. <laughs> well, good morning. Why did I pick that? <laughs> because... Well, it's an attention getter, it's humorous, but beyond that, it kind of represents my early impression or thinking about God. That he's somebody up there, if he exists, and I'm, I'm talking about, I'm going way back, like elementary school days, and you know, he's probably looking for people who are doing bad things, and that's what he would say. <laughs> Stop it. And so I basically, as a kid, decided, well, I, you know, I want to make sure that I don't do any of the things that would cause God to say, stop it. Uh, now, before I go any further with that, and I want to share with you a childhood experience that will set up our time in the scriptures this morning. But before I do that, I want to tell you something. Rod may not have explained it to you this way, but I want to tell you something he was exposed to, that we were both exposed to at Dallas Seminary, since we were both trained at the same place. That doesn't mean I'm going to measure up to the standard that Rod sets here every week. I listen to his messages because he's as clear an expositor of this book as I've seen. Rod does a great, he doesn't know I'm going to say that. He's not paying me to say that. When he sees the video, he will go off, Lord, you shouldn't have said that. Or now Rod may say, well, good, I'm glad you told him that, but uh, who knows. But one of the things we were taught, and this was when we got to the preaching courses by the d head of the homiletics department, that's a fancy word for preaching, um, communicating the truth of scriptures, he told us, he said his name's Haddon Robinson, and he said, I want you to understand that if you get up in front of a group of people and you tell them, here's what this book says about a topic, and you're not certain that that's what God has said, that's a moral issue. Uh, we're sitting there listening to him and going, whoa. It's a moral issue if I represent what God has spoken as my idea. So that's a pretty high standard. And I will tell you that, I, and I listen to Rod's messages uh, when you guys post them, and um, I've noticed that um, there are several times he has said about a certain topic, I don't, I'm not thinking of any particular one right now, but he would say, and I think that, and when Rod introduces something with I think that, it means it's not clear, we haven't, we may not have the answer to this, but here's what I think about it. In fact, I'm going to do that once this morning, but we're going to look at a topic that the Bible is very clear about. And it was one that I wish I could have heard before I was about 20 years old, because 
I was one of those good kids. I wanted to be a good kid. I had a sensitive conscience. And so I just, I was a pretty good kid. I, it really didn't cause trouble for my parents. And, um, but I had a frightening experience because my mom grew up in a very conservative religious background. And I, I wouldn't call us particularly a Christian family. I didn't have so much Christian instruction growing up. But there were some verses in the Bible that got quoted that I heard, that she had heard from her dad. And in particular, there was this, there were these words, bad words, cuss words, particularly one that has God's name in front of it, followed by God cursing someone. And, then it, and I was told, I heard her say, well, my dad said that if you say that word, you'll, God, God can't forgive you for that. Now, that was wrong, okay? It was really bad theology. It was bad biblical teaching. But this one afternoon, I'm probably nine or ten years old. It's elementary school. We were, I grew up around Goldsboro. Six years in France and the rest of the time mostly in Goldsboro until I came to college. And um, I, there were some new kids in the neighborhood. And I was, so I was hanging out with them. And we were riding our bikes. And they, were, they had pretty filthy mouths. They were using language that I didn't use. And who knows, apparently, nine, ten years old, I, to be accepted, I don't know why, but I used some words that I never used. To, to, you know, be a part of the, accepted as a part of the group. And I paid a price for that. Because Mr. Sensitive Conscience and what I had been told about these words, this one particular word. And so I, I just started agonizing over what have I done. So I don't know how long this went on, but it, it was days. And this one particular night, I'm upstairs, we lived in a two-bedroom apartment, and I can't fall asleep. So I thought, I've, I've got to, I've got to do something. I've got to figure this out because I was just really torn up inside. And so I called my mother up to my room. Can you come up here? And she comes up to my room, and I asked her. I said, Mom, if I, and I don't know if I spelled the word, probably didn't know how to spell it, but if I said a bad word, so I, I communicated to her, this word, if I said this really bad word, would I go to hell? This is, I, I'm asking some pretty heavy questions early in my life because my conscience was just fairly, my conscience was convicting me and it was a, it was a legitimate conviction. And my mom thought for a moment, and I remember thinking, I wish you weren't thinking about this. And my mom said, God bless her. I am satisfied because of conversations we had for years after that, that I know where she is right now. I believe that she is with the Lord, but she wasn't theologically trained. And so when I said, would I go to hell? My mom said, probably. Yeah, I, I, I'm not in long-term therapy, okay? It was just short-term. <laughs> and I thought... Oh, great. This one time, I vary from my normal standards, and now I'm doomed to hell. Now, this may sound silly, but I'm telling you, it's real. It was totally real to me. And, you know, I think, in all fairness to her, she, she thought that it was a theoretical question. You know, well, if, if I were to use this bad language, I haven't, but if I were to, I didn't say I haven't. I just said, would this happen? And she figured, well, it'll keep him from saying these bad language if he thinks that that would be the outcome, so he'll never use them. And I'm thinking, she doesn't know that I have. So that led me to this question. And after I tell you the question, I want to pray because... I really want to be true to what I think is the clear teaching of Jesus 
in the Gospels, in, in the Gospel of John in particular. But it led me to the question of, can a person be certain of their eternal destiny? I mean, absolutely certain. And if so, on what basis? And if the message I'm going to share with you from this book had been shared with me when I was nine years old, if <laughs> Uh, you know, would, would that she had understood this, she could have saved me about the next 10 years of agony because I had years when I didn't want to go to bed at night because I was afraid I would die during the night. Now, I didn't know if there was a God, okay? But I thought, well, maybe, maybe there is, maybe there isn't. So I'm going to hedge my bets. So let me pray and ask the Lord, Lord, would you enable me to be clear and to be true to what you have told us in your word. I really don't want this to be my ideas. I'm really seeking you. And so would you clarify it and then help each one of us to know what to do with this and how we can have it lead us to a, a better life experience with you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I kind of launched on a journey of trying to figure this out. So I just kept thinking it through logically. And here's what I thought. Well, there, there must be some kind of formula out there. And so I would occasionally listen to an evangelist on TV. And one of the messages I heard was, now, I'm not blaming this on them. I, I, I may well have misheard the message. But I saw people going forward and being invited forward to make dedications of their life to Christ in these big meetings. And so I thought, well, that's what you're supposed to do. That's it. So you go forward in some sort of a religious service. Well, I didn't go to there weren't any crusades, shall we say. So I'm a freshman at NC State. I was dating a girl who was a uh, senior in high school in Goldsboro, so, which is where I was from. So I'm down there on one Sunday, and she and I and her family are visiting a church downtown. And, you know, I, so I, I'm struggling. I'm trying to figure this out. I was getting up, by the way, on Sunday mornings out of my dorm and going to church. Um, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. But at the end of this service... I'm thinking, I got to do. I got to do something. I, I, I got to get this right. I think there must be a formula, and so I get up. I have no idea what he was preaching on that morning, no idea, and so I get up out of my pew at the end and walk forward. I thought that's what you're supposed to do. I didn't. I had no idea what I was doing. Okay, I just was doing what. I, oh well, this must be it, and I I don't know what happened up there. I, think, I don't know if he thought I was coming to join the church or what, but this was part one of the formula. Well, I didn't have any more sense of certainty after that than I had before. So whatever it was, that didn't seem to be it. So I decided I would ask a leader in our church. I was, again, a freshman in college, working at the YMCA um, on Hillsborough Street, that was the only YMCA at the time. And so I went and asked this man, and I said, I explained this experience, this church experience of walking forward and trying to say, can, can I be sure? That I was looking for certainty. And he said to me, he said, well, Floyd, he quoted a, a verse for me, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Behold, all things have become new. And so he said, so take a look at your life. And after that experience, can you see, you ought to be able to see changes that have occurred. Now, candidly, it's clear that I wasn't perfect, but it really wasn't. I was already trying to be a good person. It wasn't like, well, I was sleeping with my girlfriend and now I'm not. Or I was on drugs and now I'm not. 
or it was just I was this horrible tyrant person. And yeah, that's changed. Oh, yes, I can see changes. And candidly, that didn't, that didn't help. So here's what I figured. I, my, my, my kids to this day, these are my kids of my, grand, of my grandchildren. So kids who have kids of, them, of themselves tell me I overthink things sometime. But in this, in this particular case, I think it worked for me. Because I thought it through, and here's what I figured. Maybe there's a God, maybe there's not. If there's not, I'll just end up where everybody else does. It doesn't sound like such a great destiny, but it's not the other place. But if there is, he probably grades on the curve. I mean, I'm not using this as a preaching technique here. That's how I was thinking. I'm trying to figure it out. Now, just that from, for fun, how many of you know what I'm referring to when I say grading on the curve? Most of you, okay. <laughs> grading on a curve, there's a normal distribution. I was an applied math major, so I won't go too far down that road. But the point is, and, and so I had some statistics courses as a result, and the curve means there is this distribution of where most of the people looks like this, okay. For those of you who are math people, and most of the people fall in this section in the center. Then out here and out here where the, where the numbers get smaller are some really unusual people. There's some really unusual people out here. They're called mass murderers and rapists and really, really bad people. And I knew I wasn't one of those. And candidly, I figure I'm somewhere out here. I, I don't know how far out here. But I'm somewhere out here. So God probably grades on the curve, and when there's, if he exists and there's some final day of reckoning, then how could he turn me away? Because he probably grades on the curve. I had a geometry teacher in 10th grade who graded on the curve, and whoever got the highest grade in the class set the curve. And based on the highest grade in the class, if you got a percentage of that highest, of that highest grade, <clears throat> then you, that's determined, did, did you get an A or a B or a C? And most of the time, I set the curve in the class. I wasn't exactly the most popular person, but math was easy for me. So, but I'm thinking, God grades on the curve, and it still wasn't delivering the peace of mind. It's, it was like, because I was going with my own logic, trying to figure this out, and I didn't have an authoritative source. So this morning, I want to take you to an authoritative source, and you may be certain. If you are already certain, if you're, if you're not, this will clarify how you can be. But if you are, what I hope it'll do for you is make explaining that message to someone really simple. It's a lot simpler than we make it. And we're going to show you in the text what that message is. But each of the gospel writers has a unique purpose. So the reason there are four is because they were writing to different groups. Matthew was writing to Jews. And he was demonstrating the way he writes his gospel. He wants them to know that Jesus was their long-promised Messiah. From Abraham, from David, from the prophets, he's the Messiah. And so there are more quotations of the Old Testament in Matthew than any of the other Gospels, because Matthew is writing to Jewish people who would appreciate that. Mark is writing to Romans, and he's showing Jesus as the servant, as one who has come to serve and to give his life. Mark 10, 45, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And that's something that the Roman mind would appreciate. Luke was a Greek physician his gospel is the most chronological of the gospels. He did research to, to, to come back and tell the story of Jesus in his gospel. And by the way, as, a, as an aside, who wrote most of the New Testament? Who would ordinarily think wrote most of the New Testament? Most people would say Paul, right? Most would say Paul. By volume, most of the New Testament was written by Luke. 
because Luke and Acts were written by him. Now, <clears throat> knowing that fact is not what it takes to get into heaven either. But I just I find it interesting. Luke is writing to Greeks, showing Jesus as the perfect man. And finally, we come to the Gospel of John. John is writing to a different audience. He's writing to all men. Remember, he's a fisherman. And I want to go to the end to show you where John reveals his purpose. There's 21 chapters in the book. At the end of chapter 20, John writes, Now Jesus did many other signs. Signs are referring to miracles that he did. In the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. So he starts by saying, now by the way, Jesus did a lot of stuff that I haven't told you about, but these are written. So he's clarifying his purpose. He's saying, he did a lot of stuff I'm not telling you about, but there's a reason I'm telling you about the things that I am telling you, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So he's saying, the stuff that I've chosen to talk to you about in the Gospel of John in this book are chosen to lead you to belief and the certainty that you have life. And throughout the book, he talks about eternal life in his name. We're going to unpack the word belief. It won't take us long to do that, actually. But what does it mean to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and to know then that I have life in his name? Because the word believe, this is kind of a clue to how to interpret the Bible, appears in John's Gospel in 21 chapters, it appears 98 times. So it's, it's clear. You look at his purpose here, and you look at how many times the word's repeated, Jesus is saying the key is to believe. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at a specific incident where he has a divine encounter with a woman. So let's take a look at that. John chapter 4. In chapter 3, it was the conversation with Nicodemus. Remember the Pharisee, the religious leader? <clears throat> now, so he's in Judea. Judea is the southern kingdom. Galilee is up here in the north, where Nazareth is, where Jesus was, grew up. And then in between is this area called Samaria. So when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although he clarifies, Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples. He left Judea, so he left the south down here where Jerusalem is, and he departed again for Galilee to go up north. It's about a three days journey. We, we just came back. We got in and out of Israel just before the shutdown. So we were there in February. It's about a three, three day journey. To, to Galilee. He left Judea, departed for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria, which is the area in between. Verse 5, So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Sixth hour is about, it was about noon. So by that measurement, it was about noon. So it's middle of the day. He's walked about 30 miles at this point, and he's tired. That, by the way, is an indication of Jesus' humanity. When I read the Gospels, I think of Jesus' deity more than I do, do his humanity. I thought of his humanity a lot when we were in Israel recently. And just thinking about he, he was here, he was in these places. And so, but he was also not only fully God, he was fully man. So fully man, undiminished deity. It's about the sixth hour, he's tired. He's walked about 30 miles at this point. And so, before we go to the next passage here, what happens as he's sitting there, the disciples go into town to get food. And he's left behind. I think what we're, gonna, what we're gonna see here is a divine appointment because a woman comes to the well to draw water. And he asks her 
for a drink, which surprises her because she's a Samaritan. The Samaritans were half-breeds, if you will, part Jew and part Gentile. The Samaritans really came from the Assyrian domination, victory over the northern kingdom when the, when the Assyrians would take people out of, of, the, of a conquered territory and import other conquered people in so that they, what they would do is create a race of half-breeds to keep them from coming to power again. So the Samaritans are hated by the Jews and vice versa. And so in this conversation, Jesus asks her for a drink. She's come to draw water in the middle of the day. He asks her for a drink. And her response, to paraphrase it, is, how can you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? It's kind of like, and this is a paraphrase, I thought we hated each other. But Jesus wants her to know that there's a reason he, they're having this conversation. So let's go to verse 10. Jesus answered her. So he's just asked her for water. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus wants her to know why he's having this conversation. He's starting a conversation because it's a divine encounter and he has something he wants to give her so he asked her, can I, can I get a drink? This is, the, the Gospels mostly are filled with Jesus having conversations with people, much less so with lectures, although there were some of those, but a lot of interactions and dialogues that were told about. So the word gift here, he's saying, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. He's saying, if you knew the gift I could give you, and that word, by the way, gift, has the idea in it of something that expects no repayment. It focuses on the beneficent desire of the giver, not the worthiness of the receiver. So he says to her, I have a gift that I could give to you, and I would like to do that. So he's engaging her in this conversation. Now let's go down to verses 13 and 14. So Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water, this water from the well, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. This was a well that exists to this day. And this, so this is 2,000 years ago. It was spring-fed. And so they were able to get fresh water from it all the time and because they flowed all the time. And by the way, and if, if you visit Israel, the, if, if anybody could visit anywhere anymore, if you were to visit there, the guides would tell you that that spring still flows 2,000 years later. And so he's saying it would become in him a spring of water springing up to eternal life. So what Jesus is clarifying for her is, I have a gift to give to you. See, what I was doing when I was a kid and then coming up till about freshman in college was I was just working my way, trying to work my way into God's favor. And it's one route that doesn't work because we aren't saved by works. You know about that. But I want you to notice how he spells it out in this conversation. So now he's clarified that the gift is eternal life, but he needs her to know who it is that's offering her that gift. So because someone could promise you eternal life and not have the authority to make good on it. He wants her to know that he has the authority to make good on that promise. So he says to her, um, go get your husband. Go, go, go get your husband and bring him back. Now, Jesus is doing that. I'm, I'm going to do one of the rod, I think, things, okay? I think Jesus knew she was going to be there. The text doesn't tell me that. But he knows some amazing things about her that make me suspect that 
he was expecting this divine encounter. So the disciples go into town for food, and he's there when she comes. So she needs to know who he is that can offer her eternal life. It's only based on his identity does he have the authority to do that. So when he says, go get your husband, bring him back, she says, well, I, I don't have a husband. And Jesus responds, I know you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands, and you're living with a man now. Who is it, your husband? <laughs> to, to which she responds, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. This is called the understatement of the day, at least. The understatement of the week, understatement of the <laughs> forever, because he knows something about her that he couldn't possibly know. He, they had never met before. They've never had an encounter before. They've never had a conversation before, but he knows. She's had five husbands, and he knows, and now she's living with a man who isn't her husband. And we're going to come back to that, because in John chapter 3, Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, a religious leader, a Pharisee, a teacher, a respected person, now he's having a conversation with a person at the other end of the curve. An immoral Samaritan woman. So Nicodemus is named in, in John chapter 3. This woman isn't even named. We, re we refer to her as the woman at the well. We talk about his conversation with Nicodemus because we're told his name. So we're talking about a very different kind of person. And she goes, you must be a prophet. Now, let's look at verses 25 and 26. So the woman said to him, when, she, when he's revealed this about her, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. It could not be clearer. Jesus is saying, you are in the presence of the one who has been prophesied through hundreds of years since Abraham, really ultimately since Adam, but specifically down through the years of the Abraham, the patriarchs, David, the prophets, I speak to you, I'm he. So what he's saying is, I have the authority to, to make good on my promise of eternal life. And he's describing it as a gift. You know, that's all I would have needed to hear. At 10 years old, I could have got that. I could have got, well, it's a gift. There's nothing you can do to work and gain it, but there's also nothing you can do to lose it. Well, I would have been all over that message. <laughs> but here's what's happening in, in this passage. First of all, the entire town comes out. She goes back into town and tells the town, let me tell you about this man that I just met and the stuff he told me about myself. Could this be the Messiah? And so we read in verses 39 to 42, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So I don't know what else went on in that conversation, but he told her a bunch of stuff that he could not have known unless his claim to be the Messiah were true. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe. For, what, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. So he is, so this whole town, this is a divine encounter, Jesus with an immoral Samaritan woman that changes an entire town. Uh, undoubtedly, eventually changes a country because the word is spreading all over. We have met the Messiah. And, here's, and we believe that he is who he says he is, and that he can offer legitimately what he offers us as a free gift without any obligation on our, on our part. So they meet 
where we started today, the requirement of the purpose of John. John said, these things that I have chosen, I've chosen that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and that believing you might have life in his name. Immoral woman, moral leader, Nicodemus, he, the requirements are the same for both. High morals, low morals, he tells both of them to believe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him. So he tells a respected religious leader to believe. He tells an immoral woman to believe. It's the same requirement for both. In fact, if you'll recall in Matthew chapter, I'm sorry, not Matthew, in John chapter 11, so the same book, same purpose, Jesus, when he raises Lazarus from the dead, has this conversation with her brother, with her, with Lazarus' sister, Martha. And he says to her, he says, Martha, everyone who, believe, who lives and believes in me will never die. And then he asks her this question, do you believe this? The focus in the, in the Gospel of John over and over and over is the word believe. Now, we're going to come back to believe what? But let me go ahead and say it because I really don't want us to miss this. Believing that Jesus will fulfill his promise of eternal life. So I'm, what am I believing? I'm believing in the trustworthiness of Jesus. That's what I'm called to believe. That he was God in human flesh. He died on a Roman cross to pay the penalty for our sins. And so I simply believe that based on that, he can offer me eternal life and he'll make good on it. That's what I believe. Now, I want to share with you several examples that I want you to, to be on the lookout for because this message really gets confused today. 98 times Jesus says, believe. He apparently thought that was enough. But we make it so much more complicated. Not your pastor, okay? He doesn't make it more complex than this, I can assure you. But it's rare because we try to add so much to it. In fact, sometimes it's called... That's just cheap grace. And cheap grace is, a, is an unfortunate term that came from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, but I think probably is an unfair use of it, unfair to Bonhoeffer. But people use it to say, no, just believing in, in Jesus' sacrificial death for you, guaranteeing you eternal life, isn't enough. When it was enough for Jesus... 98 times, John says, believe, 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 believe. A gift, excuse me, a gift, a gift's value isn't based on what it costs the recipient. Think about this for a moment. I, we've had six kids, four adopted from Russia, two biologically, and <clears throat> we haven't bought cars for all of them, but we have bought a couple of cars for a few of them. And you know what? I didn't do it. They weren't expected to pay for it. At the time, they couldn't pay for it. But they didn't call it cheap because it was free. It was free, not cheap. What, measure, what, what determined the value is the cost to the giver, not the cost to the recipient. So get rid of the term cheap grace. It's called free grace. The free grace of God offers us the gift of eternal life simply by believing Jesus for it. I want to give you a couple of other distinctions and things that it's just easy to get sucked into. For example, some would say to you, like the gentleman who said to me, Floyd, can you see differences in your life? Some would tell you that works... Good works must authenticate saving faith. Jesus never said that. Okay? And by the way, 
think about it logically. If you're if you have to have works and enough Christ likeness to prove that you really believed, I've heard that question some asked sometimes. Yeah, but did you really believe, or was it just intellectual assent? If you have to, then how much good works? And I would claim that you'll never know for sure. If you if it requires works to authenticate that you truly believe Jesus for eternal life, then how much? How will you ever know? I would argue that we will never know. But if there were ever an opportunity to change the message and add works to it, this was it. He's talking with an immoral woman who had to come to the well in the middle of the day when there was no one else there because she was so despised. If there was ever an opportunity where works needed to be a part of the package, this would have been it. So it's called receive a gift, not clean up your life. Now we're going to come back to the clean up your life part, but it's not, I don't know how to say this more clearly than cleaning up our lives and living good lives, living, being transformed into Christ's likeness is an absolutely good thing and an important thing. And we're going to end in just a minute on that note, but not as, an, as a requirement for eternal life. Believing who Jesus is and what he has offered to us. Um, one, of the, one of my favorites, shall we say, you may have heard this one. We're saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. Now, I want you to stop. I'm trying to present to you, I'm, I'm trying to clarify the believing message because that's not the believing message. Faith alone saves you, but the faith that saves is never alone. <clears throat> Here's how I would change that sentence. And, th and that preaches, okay? That really preaches, and you'll hear it plenty times. You won't hear it here. At least like you won't hear it from me, you won't hear it from Rod. Um, faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is likely, likely to lead you to become a better person because you're responding to the grace of God, not trying to measure up to some standard, to some artificial standard or some standard of going and trying to be like Jesus because until we're in eternity, we won't be fully like him. We will be like him then, John says in 1 John, because we'll see him as he really is. So if, whenever you hear the expression, we're saved by faith alone, but whatever comes after the but, question it. Okay? Because what comes after the but is what the person really believes. We're saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. So what the person was telling me to do was look to my behavior. Look to my works as a, for assurance. And what I would say to you is, no, this passage is saying we look to the cross. Now let me tell you my, my divine encounter, and then we'll close. But my divine encounter wasn't at a well in Samaria. It was at the YMCA, again, when I was a freshman in college. And I'm, having this, I'm going through this struggle of how can I know for sure? Is there a God? And I, I had had this experience of going forward in this church down in Goldsboro. And I'm off work that day lifting weights on one side of the weight room. There's other two guys who are over here talking and they're talking about God. Now, I've never heard anybody talk about God like they were talking about him. And I started getting really quiet because I wanted to hear what they were saying. So one of them leaves the room, goes to get a shower, and there's just two of us left. And I thought, man, I've never heard anybody talk about God like this. I, I wanna, I've got some questions. So I wanted to ask him the same question 
that I ask the church leader who said, look at your life and see what your life, if your life is changing enough. Well, what happened in that conversation? I walked over and said, could I interrupt you and just, I got a couple of questions for you. So I asked him the same question. Here's what happened to me. I described walking forward in this church service again, because that was as close as I could get to what's the right thing or just trying to be a good person. And what he did was he shared with me his experience of coming to saving faith, the belief that we're talking about this morning. And here's what happened for me. A transaction took place where I shifted from trusting in my own good works to trusting that the cross was all that it took and believing that the cross was sufficient, necessary and sufficient. And I believed. You know, we didn't pray together. And a lot of other things might happen. Okay, let me, let me clarify. For some people, when they come to Saving Faith, and it, I, I, for sure, with this, with this size group, some of you would share this. Sometimes the saving belief is accompanied by, can be, by emotion. It can be accompanied by leaving one lifestyle for a much better lifestyle. That can happen. And hooray if it happens. Okay, but that's not eternal life. It is one of the intended outcomes, but it's not what saves us. I, I hope I've been clear about that. I guess I've beaten it hard enough now that probably, probably we're, <laughs> we're clear about that. If anyone wants to talk about it afterwards, then I'll be happy to stay around and do that. But. Living the Christian life by just trying to be good leads either to pride or despair. I want to close with Jesus' last words from the cross. And they say it as clearly as anything else, anything that I've ever read. When Jesus was on the cross, do you remember what his last words were before it says he gave up his spirit and died? His last words were, it is what? Finished. He said, it is finished. The words, it is finished, are the translation of the Greek word in the Greek text. And by the way, you don't need to study Greek and Hebrew to understand the Bible. Sometimes you get a little extra color. And that's why Rod and I studied what we did in seminary, because it gives us some extra color, but context is what's essential to interpreting the Bible. But in this case, it's important and helpful, instructive to know the word that it is finished is translated. The Greek word that John uses is tetelestai. It's T-E-T-E-L-E-S-T-A-I. Tetelestai is the Greek word. That word is the word that when a receipt was paid in full, they, and they have found this, archaeologists have found this in Israel, uh, examples of receipts that had an abbreviation of tetelestai or the actual word tetelestai. Because what it was saying is paid in full. So right before Jesus gave up his spirit and died for us, his last words were, paid in full. You believe that and trust that, that your sin, past, present, and anything to come in the future has been paid in full. You believe that and that guarantees you eternal life, you have on the authority of Jesus himself, you have eternal life. And what I hope that does for you, I, one of the expressions I like is preach the gospel to yourself every day. Remind yourself every day to tell us, die, Lord, thank you that is paid in full. Because what I believe that will do is focus us on the grace of God and cause us to live our lives out responding to the reality of his grace, not trying to measure up. And the likelihood is 
that it'll change us. But the changing is a result of it happening. It's not the cause of eternal life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. I so ask you to take this message and just bury it deep into our souls that we might be grateful people for what you've done for us and that we would have no questions going forward about where not we will where we will spend our eternal destiny in Jesus name amen